Welcome to the Finnish Music Creators discussion. Uh, today's subject is the walk-in fee. I am Lumi Olila. I'm the coordinator at the Finnish Music Creators and a member myself, a songwriter. And I have great guests here today. Um, we're all on three different time zones. Uh, so welcome Helian Lindvall and uh, Tobias Stink here. Did I do a good job? You did. <laughs> Thank you. So could you both uh, introduce you yourself um, briefly and maybe the organization you represent? Let's start with uh, with Helian. Yep. Uh, my name is obviously Helian Lindvall. Uh, I'm a songwriter uh, and producer. And uh, also I've written a column for The Guardian about the music industry in the past called Behind the Music. Um, I'm also a, a member, board member of, of uh, the Ivers Academy, which used to be called the British Academy of Songwriters. Um, so um, it's sort of the same as, as your organization, but on the UK side, I'm Swedish originally. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that, that kind of covers Yeah, it covers what we do over here. Oh, and I'm also a member of EXA, which is how we know each other, um, uh, how I know to be us uh, from uh, the European uh, Composer and Songwriters Alliance. Great, thank you. Tobias? Yeah, well, I am the chair of DPA, Danish Professional Songwriters and Producers, and we are a 103-year-old organization We were founded by the um, by the um, the text writers, the lyrics writers for for theaters because the theaters didn't want to pay for using our rights. So they formed a guild to negotiate with the theaters, and then eight years later, we founded Coda, our PRO, because the Danish national radio came about. So we needed a platform to negotiate from for the use of our rights. So at the core of what we do here is the fight for the right for fair remuneration whenever our rights are being used to create a revenue stream for theaters, streaming services, etc. So we're building on a long tradition of fighting for remuneration. Oh, and I'm a songwriter and producer and artist and all that as well, obviously. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, so let's go to the subject of today, which is uh, this thing called walk-in fee. Would one of you want to, or both, define it? What does it mean? Um, well, I can say, because it's a little bit uh, different but what we call it as well. Like in the UK, we don't call it a walk-in fee because um, the kind of connotation of that in the UK is that you're just walking in, which actually what we're doing is uh, developing the artist. So um, we we uh, call it like, like an artist development per diem. And the reason we call it a per diem uh, is for a couple of different reasons. We want to make sure that it doesn't get connected to what's produced that day. Um, tax reasons as well. Um, so uh, it's mainly for, for covering expenses um, uh, that we incur when we, when we uh, work with artists. Great, would you, Tobias, have a different... Uh... No, I, I, I think we, you know, semantically, we we went about it the same ways as um, as you guys did, Helian, because a walk-in fee sounds arrogant, basically. Here I am, give me your money-ish, <laughs> because what we do is we show up, we play the big brother, the big sister, the psychologist, the A&R. We basically help shape the identity of an artist on that day we help them develop their sound their image their idea and that in and by itself is is something that hasn't been recognized that much but the proportions of it have just grown because a and r's do less and less a and r work in the traditional respect so we we get to serve as the real a and r's who help develop the artists 
And I mean, it, it's almost biblical. I mean, we're the first, first to come and the last to get paid. So the first shall be the last. Um, and we're losing a generation of songwriters here. So the, uh, we just call them fees, basically songwriting fees, because that's what we do. And then you all obviously have hold fees. If someone wants to take your song off the market to try it out, there's fees for use of demo tracks, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, we, we steered clear of the walk-in fee as well and just called it songwriting fees or just in Denmark, it's now just fees. Okay. I don't know where this walk-in fee comes, comes from then. Germany, that's what they call it, call it in Germany. Okay. All right. So what, what you were saying, Tobias, is interesting. Do you mean that the, this fee should be paid only when the artist is kind of uh, present at a session? Or do you mean that uh, the songwriter always kind of uh, is in the process of doing all this for the artist? No, I think it's it's important to to look at each session as something as its own specific term. So if I were to call up Helian and go, hey, you want to write a song for whatever, mm -hmm. no specific, that could just be us having a session. But the minute you're commissioned to do something by a label or a publisher or a management, You know, when they call you up because you're the plumber and you have to come install these pipes because you're the best at this type of plumbing job, that's when we talk about fees in general because that's when you are commissioned over someone else and they want your specific set of, of tools yeah. to, do, to do a job. But again, as we were talking about prior to this recording, it's negotiation is a key word here because it differs from situation to situation. If you're working with a major artist who's doing really well on radio, you know, you know that you're going to see a lot of money down the line if you get the single. Whereas if you're working with an artist who only does streaming or worse yet YouTube, you're not going to see a penny mm. in remuneration down the line. So that's when you may need a bigger fee And on streaming, you may need a smaller fee and uh, points on the master. Or so. But the key is to always think of it as a negotiation, not a demand, mm. not an ultimatum, but more, okay, so what are the revenue streams for this particular artist or this particular song or session? And which one or ones do I want to tap into? Could I potentially tap into Can I just add to that? I think the uh, what we've seen to, why this is important, in particular, what the what the why the per, per diems are important is because what happens usually uh, when you work as a non-performing writer um, is that um, when a, a a label signs an artist, um, they will uh, put that artist in with with producers and songwriters um, to develop their sound. Um, so you might have a week or two with one team and then a week or two with an another team. And if it's a bigger artist, this can be like they can accumulate like 50 songs, maybe even more. And then they'll pick the ones that they want to use. Um, you, you can have somebody um, um, like I, I, a very big songwriter friend of mine from the U.S. was working with a very big American uh, uh, artist and develop that artist before that artist actually kind of broke through and spent loads of time and money flying over working with that artist. And in the end, they got a bonus track on the record. Um, now on streaming, if you get a bonus track, you're lucky if you make enough to like uh, cover like one of the train travels even, or maybe even a coffee uh, if it's, you know, um, At, at some uh, <laughs> instances so so that actually you, you end up losing money by working with an artist and the the respect uh, for the um input that artists uh, make or, and give or, you know needs to be um valued and remunerated and i think back in the day i mean this because this happened before streaming as well 
But when people bought records, if you had a, a song on a record, even if it wasn't a single, you could still like roll it over, you know, so that so that you'd make enough to kind of cover your your expenses. But with yeah. streaming, it's such a single based market that if you're if you're not if it's not a single, if it's not played on the radio, then you're most likely not going to make make enough money. And I I know like a couple of examples that we had with our songwriter committee at the Irish Academy where. Uh, one writer um, worked with uh, a new artist um, uh, that uh, I think they it ended up being the Heat Seeker song that they got. She um, got a babysitter for the day, went and, and traveled to the studio, which was outside of London and back. And, and the, the track ended up getting about 350, 500,000 um, streams. And that didn't even cover... The, the babysitter for that day and and i had we had another writer who said that um the artist called up on the morning of the session and said they were hung over and wasn't they weren't going to come in and this songwriter had already booked a, a, a babysitter for that day so again you know they, because there is no that, you know, there, there's no value put on that time of the songwriter. And I think this is, it's, it's gotten to a point because of streaming where something had to be done uh, to kind of uh, compensate and, and make sure that you're not losing money from doing your job. Exactly, because it's not only about doing uh, work for free, but as you said, losing money. And that that is, uh, well, even doing uh, work for free is a problem, but this is a... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, an even bigger, bigger one. Um, did you have Tobias something to say about this, or or can we? Yeah, well, I, 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 you know, I just want to you know give a very concrete example. Um, when we first met Helien um, in Exa, I was set to fly out to have sessions for a for for a major upcoming artist in Norway. So I flew from. I think it was Stockholm, actually. I had to fly back to Copenhagen where I live, get a hotel for the night because I had to be at the airport too early to think about, to travel to Norway, spend two days at the studio, right, with this artist and, and the team, and then travel back. So if we're looking at it, all in all, it's three days worth of work. Um, it's hotel and it's airfare plus train to the studio I was lucky enough to get the two singles yay really great but I was only one out of seven or eight riders who had been flown in over a two week period for an EP so I could just as well have wasted three full working days had all the expenses for, for airfare and and whatnot. And now, yay, uh, the first single has just been certified gold in Norway, which is really great. Until I went and actually looked at the numbers and it's gonna cost me more after taxes to have the plaque produced yeah. than I made from being certified gold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had a writer that that happened to. It's about well, it happens to all our writers, right? Because the the labels won't even pay for the uh, pay for the gold record. So you know, um, one of our writers was saying that she asked for a gold record for for um, well, also a very big artist, and uh, they said, oh, it's going to be two hundred pounds, and two hundred pounds was more than she made from uh, certified gold in the UK. So. I mean, mm. it's just that these, these are very tangible examples that I think are, are really good to, mm. to bring into the conversation Yeah, um, to kind of show the realities of, of what's happening. So it's not like, you know, we're demanding to get rid of We're not doing anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. It's, it's like basic, you know. Mm. Basic needs. Basic, uh, yeah, basic yeah, needs. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in the UK, Helene, there's uh, this campaign going on called Pay Songwriters. Uh, if I understood correctly, you, you're somehow involved in this campaign. Can you tell a little bit about that? 
kind yeah, of yeah so um i well we because we have the fixed streaming yeah so so basically what happened was that this pandemic has really kind of like turbocharged our, our campaigning in the uk um we we started like discussing pay songwriters before before the pandemic um but then it it kind of became because of, of the pandemic and be because even artists um, that had been able to paper over the track, uh, the cracks with uh, touring were, were um, suddenly looking at what they were making from streaming and, and understood, you know, how, how dire it is. Um, so we managed to get song that songwriters that are also artists to, to come along uh, with us on this pay songwriters um, campaign. So it was basically initially, um, so I, I chaired the songwriter uh, committee for the Iris Academy. And uh, um, I was talking to um, a whole bunch of managers, songwriter managers, and um, me and a few of these managers um, decided to launch this campaign, very grassroots to start off with, um, where we just got a, a tag. We got a, an Instagram pay songwriters page and we started talking. We, we, we set up a website and, it, and we did all this and then I kind of brought it, brought it back into to the Ivers um, because obviously managers are not members of, of the Ivers. But um, we, uh, we then talked to a whole bunch of songwriters and we got you know, people in the U.S., big writers in the U.S., Rick Knowles, Ross Golan, um, uh, some, uh, some artists that were also big songwriters. We got Andrew Lloyd Webber. We got Georgia Moroder. All of these people were signing our petition for um, songwriters to get paid. And it, it was per diems. We, we set the, the rate um, at, you know, a minimum of 75, just so people would know like a ballpark what we were looking at and um, 75 pounds and this was more like a per diem to cover cost but also um we uh proposed uh to give uh points on the master uh for the songwriters and that would come from the label um not from the artist to be recouped um because that's usually what happens when you go to a label and and say you want points and they said Oh sure, go and talk to the manager, and and the artist is already paying out the, the producer points and and the mixed points. Um, so we wanted actually because what we really wanted was for the uh, royalty pie, so to speak, of of streaming to be um, divided differently, which is what fixed streaming, our other cam our bigger campaign for the with the government was about. But we realized that that campaign is a long haul because obviously labels negotiate separately with streaming companies apart you know from uh pros and and publishers um so it's a, a much more kind of complicated way and 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 long-term fix that that we need on that side so in the meantime for songwriters not to you know um go under and leave the profession completely we saw this as the, the immediate short-term um, solution and a way of getting, of, of redistributing royalties would be to get the points on the master from the label. And we said with that too, I mean, uh, even, even the mixer get, gets a point. So um, how come we don't get a point? And I think what was really important for us, it, uh, which I mentioned earlier, is that it's not, um, in any way connected to what is produced on that day. Because we, we talked to um, uh, the head of business affairs for one of the big record labels in, in the run up to it, uh, to the campaign launching. And that um, person said, well, you know, we're not against it, but how's it gonna work? What if on that day, a song is written and we don't, we don't uh, take that song and then the other label uh, you know, major label um, that they take it, um, you know, who's going to pay it then? And I said, it has nothing to do with what's produced on that day. It has to do with, you know, covering expenses and, and, and uh, you know, the, the basics for that, for that day. It doesn't have anything to do with a copyright. And I think this is really important, obviously, because we do not want to, you know, give up the copyright that is something completely different this is simply i mean if you look at a label they they get their expenses covered if they go to meetings if they you know actually 
in in many cases, A and R's get points on the master when a when a record is released. So songwriters who are actually the engine of the entire industry, we're like the lowest on the totem pole, and it's just not um, feasible. Or, yeah. or uh, you know, it, it's uh, it can't remain this this way. It's unsustainable. So how do you, do you feel like this? campaign is going in in the right direction like does it did it have any effect yet can you have you heard about this put in place uh, do you have good experiences on this yes yeah. so we we've been also working and 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 uh, talking to um organizations in the u.s sona sona also signed, signed uh, our our um campaign as did the hundred percenters which is another um Uh, organization in the U.S. and there's starting to be, it's starting to become a conversation behind the scenes. Nobody has wanted to kind of come out apart from like a few indie labels here in the U.K. that have just gone out and said we're going to do it. We've worked out a way to get points on on uh, the master. This is about the you know the the per diems actually we have managed to get on on a more regular basis. The points on the master has been a, a Uh, a more a harder slog to to negotiate, but there there have been independent labels that have set up that have actually come out. Like um, there's a label called the Other Songs, um, which has actually said they're going to pay all songwriters that that write for their artists. They're going to pay, um, give them uh, points on the master. That is great, great to hear. Yes. Uh, what about Tobias in in Denmark? Do you have? Similar well, campaigns. Now, yeah, but I, I mean, about a year ago, we introduced our guidelines for um, for fees and points in the master, which is something you know, it's just a very tangible piece, you know, albeit digital, but still sort of a piece of paper that you can bring to just keep in mind what kind of revenue streams do records generate. Because we've, you know, traditionally, and this is also, I mean, we're trying to remake how we how we get our money. Because traditionally, we're paid, we're remunerated for the public performance of our songs on radio or live or streaming, etc. And what we're now seeing is that. Because streaming is geared roughly five to one, so the master share is worth five times that, five times the uh, the copyright. But they don't have to, you know, they don't have to print copies, physical copies anymore. They don't have trucks. They don't have storage. They don't have breakage. They don't have buy bags, all that stuff. So it's only natural to look at. Okay, our value has diminished to such a degree that we need to look at other revenue streams. So when we, we released the fees and um, points in the master guidelines, there was definitely some pushback, especially from small outfits whose business model was built on owning the masters, master rights, because that's the only way they could justify having a publishing wing, et cetera. I mean, their base economy wasn't that strong So some of some of those saw it as a direct threat to them. Whereas, uh, you know, ironically enough, most of the major labels, the product managers, the A and Rs, and I, this for me, this is an important point. What we did was we enabled our members to talk to those who actually handle the budgets. I mean, if you go to the label executive. He's going to go, well, company policy dictates that we don't do this. However, as soon as you reach the layer where they're actually working with the artist, and it's, I mean, to them, it's just, it's just budget figures. So, I mean, if they're going to take out a hundred pounds from the music video to cover that cost, as long as it's a zero sum game, budget wise for them. They're as interested as anyone in getting the right song for their artist. We can't hear you anymore. Come on. Sorry about that. It's my my AirPods or 
acting up. But anyways, what we're seeing is that as soon as you approach A&Rs and product managers who are the ones who handle the economy on the specific projects, they are willing to talk to you. In terms of points on the master, things are now at the point, uh, no pun intended, um, where it isn't a, de a debate of whether you should get it, it's where the points should be taken from. And that's the next negotiation because some of the most of the labels are going, well, we've set aside three, three points for third party and the producers are already getting two. I mean, producers get them mixed Mix engineers, mastering engineers, a &Rs get them. We're the only ones who don't get them. But they say, well, we've already set aside this allotted amount of points. So if you want to get it too, you have to take, out, take it out of the artist share or the entire amount of points will be moved to the artist share. So they're sort of aggregating the fight so instead of actually just negotiating with us as writers, they're trying to push the fight back between the creators to go, well, if you do that, you're going to steal from steal from the um, from the producer or the artist so that we can duke it out, basically. And they can just go, well, sorted. It's interesting because actually here, the, those points for the producers and mixers come out of the artist share already. Hmm. So the, this, everything is always put back on the artist. Um, and, and even with that, when it comes to uh, per diems, if they, can, if they can and take it, you know, as a, as a, a recoupable mm -hmm. uh, fee, they will. And I think we, we felt um, that we wanted to get artists. It was important to get artists on mm -hmm. our side. Um, because, again, it's they're always when you campaign, you're campaigning, it's like nobody knows who we are because we're behind the scenes so if you can get artists to to speak for us and and also we do know that for artists they they um they get a, a very small share as well of streaming so when we're looking at even with our bigger campaign the fixed streaming campaign artists that that get 20 percent today i mean if they if they were signed in the 80s they probably get like you know 10 percent but um, uh, now today, a lot of artists, like especially with a major label, they get 20%. But out of that, the, there are points that going to the producer, points going to, to the mixing engineer. Everything is recoupable. So for us, we're, um, we don't want our points, as you were saying, to be, be as to that, you know, we don't want it to come from the producer's side, because we also, I mean, a lot of us are songwriters and producers, and and we don't want to be the ones who are kind of uh, just fighting over the crumbs, while the other side, the label side, as we've seen on, you know, on the published figures, let alone how the head of the biggest major label, how much he's getting paid this year, you know, more than all UK songwriters combined. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's just, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, it has to come from the label side and they, they are initially going to try to push it over to the artist. Um, and of course, like if it's a, an artist that has a, a JV, like they got 50, 50 deal, then that could be, you know, an option. So you always have to look at the, the, the different options that you have. Uh, in the same way as we were just uh, saying that sometimes it could be if it's a, a, an artist that is developing in the beginning that doesn't have a label deal yet, just put a, a simple uh, agreement in place that says when you do have a deal, you know, then I will be able to get these fees and, and points on the master so that songwriters um, can participate in the in the success when they've actually developed a, a project that that becomes successful mm. yeah I think, that, I think the core of the matter is uh, that as long as the label the master rights owner i think that's the important as long as the master rights owner is disproportionately benefiting from this business model points should always come from that share. I mean, in Denmark, it's not uncommon that you have a 50-50 split 
on on digital but anyway any anything north of that anything you know that favors the master owner points should be taken from the master owner share because they have so many points to give i mean what's it to them if they give us one or two points it's not like we're asking for the entire pantry we're just asking for that one little can of peaches that's yeah. up on the top shelf i mean it's not going to matter to them if we get a point or two because even if we do get that they're still going to have like 80% left yeah it's just to make it a little bit more fair kind of it isn't we're not asking for everything we're asking for a tiny slice mm. of their pie and it, and i want Sorry, Helen, go for it. I was just going to add one thing that I think is important too. When we were talking, you, you know, we published on our sites, both on the Idaver side and on the DPA sites, um, you know, our, our um, suggestions of, of um, holding fees, STEM fees, um, songwriter fees, and, 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 per, uh, and points on the master. We also, as we mentioned in the beginning, we're um, all members of the European Composer and Songwriter Alliance. And we, because we realized that we were all doing the same thing in like Germany, in, in uh, uh, the UK, in Denmark, that actually we should do it uh, Europe wide. Hmm. Uh, so we sat down, the three of us, um, like the, the, the three kind of uh, heads of these campaigns in the separate um, countries and, and worked out a um, uh, a Europe-wide uh, proposal of, of how people can use it, so where uh, which is um, published on the uh, uh, site of Excel. Yeah, that's that's very important to make it kind of uh, uh, general because that's what music is about today. It's very international. It's just not not about countries anymore. <laughs> I want to read this sentence, which for me kind of re resumes it all, which is from PaySongwriters.com. It says, we need a sustainable model of compensation for music writers that reduces the risk of writers quitting the business or taking on second jobs due to the increasing costs of operating. And this is like why uh, it is important because we, we fear uh, at the Finnish music creators that uh, songwriting is not attractive at all anymore. And this will reduce diversity in, in the songwriters. And what does it mean? It means that the music becomes like, a, um, well, we lose a lot of richness from uh, new, new uh, songwriters or um, even like students uh, wonder, well, what's it gonna be like in the future? Is, is there anything to do anymore? Is it, uh, can, I, can I live from, from making music? And this is why it's, I think very important to have this kind of attractiveness uh, of this club. To add something with that, I, I listened to, oh God, I can't remember his name, but it was a Nashville writer that was talking on, on um, and the writer is Ross Geller's or, or, or Ross Golan's uh, podcast. And, and he was paying all his writers that came in with, uh, to work with him. Um, and he said that it, it makes the writers more, uh, first of all, more likely to come in and work with him because uh, other it, it's gotten to a point now where writers would only come in if they know, the, you know, high, high level writers, if they know it's going to be a single. And, and, there's, and then when they do go in, they're so focused on it being a single that actually the, uh, the risk taking and the, and that, that goes with creating a new sound for somebody, creating you know a new something that actually breaks the norm um, is is lost because people have to be so risk averse because otherwise you're not if you don't get a single, you're not gonna you know you're not gonna be able to even pay pay for the, the cost that you you incurred to get there. So I think in a broader sense, if we if if people get tired and say that music is sounding the same, then maybe you know that that's part of the reason why. And for us to to actually get a more diverse, as you say, uh, music scape and actually producing songs that are going to be played for 
10 years forward instead of just playing old songs, then, um, then you know, we, we have to support that creativity and, and, and uh, you know, simply support songwriters for, for putting their, their um, time and effort and knowledge into developing artists. So, Helene, I know you and I have talked a bit about this, but, I mean, what are some of the most common pushbacks that your writers receive? Because, I, I mean, on our end, I, the other week, I, I got a phone call on Tuesday from one negotiating with a label that said, okay, you can get, you can get the points. We're going to take them either from there or there. And then on Thursday, I get a call from a writer manager who says, same label, says, we've never done this before. So, I mean, yeah, I mean but there's, there's, what are the pushbacks that you guys encounter aside from never done it before? Yeah, never done it before, which is actually the, that's how we got the idea in the first place. We had a, a meeting um, with a whole group of managers of, of big songwriters and, and we mentioned the whole points thing or, and this one writer said, oh, I asked um, um uh, one of the major labels for, for points and they said, oh, we don't do, we don't do this. And uh, a manager on the other side of the table said, actually, we just got points from them. So we started comparing stories. And what, what usually happens is the labels try to kind of play us up against each other and said, okay, we'll give you this, but you can't tell anybody else because then we can't do it again. And this happens all the time. And I think that this is why we wanted to kind of open this up and actually um, make it more transparent and for everyone to talk to each other. And we're actually planning on, on um, you know, publishing different um, responses that you can give to, you know, we've never, never done this before. Um, uh, if we do this, we, we won't be able to do that or you're not going to be hired again. Or because obviously the, the points thing is even more um, uh, important when it comes to the, when they take a song that where you've not worked with the artist. So if you don't get per diems because you didn't work with the artist, you just pitch the song. So then we tend, tend to actually um, push harder for the points. And we had one example because we're now comparing like emails as well, where, where uh, finally when we pushed really hard, the, the label said, okay, well, you know, I think there were four writers and, and that were not the artists. And uh, uh, they said, okay, well, you know, we can give one point. And we're like, oh, so four points altogether. They're like, no, one point. And you can split between each other. And we're like, no, that's not going to work. You know, and, and uh, you kind of think, well, if you could do one point, why can't you do four points? in the end and and again you know we we pushed back and there were the the managers have gotten to a point where they said actually we'll just take it and give it somewhere else but I have to say that I I can't divulge who this is but um a big label is actually uh opening up and and kind of starting talks because they can see if they do this on a more broader basis they're going to get the, the hits and the bigger writers coming to them first with their songs. And because and, we've been very, very um, open with that. And, and our American colleagues have said the same thing. So um, what, um, and what we get, if we can't get the points, usually what people say, then if we push hard enough, they say, okay, well, it's easier for us to pay a fee. Mm -hmm instead of doing the admin, fine with us, you know, just as long as the, the uh, value is there. So that happens, uh, has happened quite a few times because they just think, oh, this is going to be such a headache now. Um, it's easier for us to just pay a few grand. Yeah, because the arbitrary value of a point on the master, because what is the worth of a point on the master even? I mean, you, you see a &Rs who get so confused by that and her like oh then i'd rather just pay the fee so that's also a negotiating tactic to, to to up the price of the fee and just to talk about the points on the master if they're taking outside songs or he didn't write with the artist even the biggest songwriters 
out there, they may have a cut rate of somewhere around 10 to 15 percent, which means that if they write two songs a week, that's 104 songs a year, they get 15 songs cut. So nine days out of 10, you get up in the morning to write a song that's never going to happen. And you and need to pay for that time as well. Yeah. And of those, maybe one or two will become uh, radio, uh, get radio play. Exactly. So that's like two out of a uh, hundred. So, Yeah, what I've, uh, in this discussion, I feel like it's, uh, it's also, um, I mean, one of the outcomes I wish of this discussion is to make it kind of normal for songwriters to talk about money because this is something that we hear a lot at the Finnish music creators is that they don't want to be the uh, difficult difficult guy or, or girl if they if they bring up this because uh, that is kind of the re- response they get that oh you're doing this for money <laughs> and this is for me yes. ridiculous because who It's would not profession. work We're for, doing it for money, money. <laughs> but where, I mean, producers didn't use to get uh, fees. Producers didn't use use to get points on the master. You know, it was only because they, they, a few of them just said, oh, this is not worth it. Like, so, you know, slowly but surely now every producer gets points. So it's just changing the conversation. And, and you know, nobody says that a producer is not, you know, um, is money oriented for getting paid everyone in the whole ecosystem is getting paid exactly but, but i also songwriters think, at the moment but yeah. Yeah. but i also think that one important aspect here is is to talk about the gendered nature of of this conversation because a lot of our female top liners as soon as they start asking for money they they get gendered a lot i know this this can sound weird but it's like a and r's from what i hear i mean obviously i don't get it the same <laughs> way they just get angry with me but they take it personal when a female writer wants fees or points on the master whereas i mean some of our members even have a, a fake email address where they put in a man where they have a male manager who then writes the exact same words, which is then taken seriously. So I also think we need to address the issue of A&Rs or just our counterparts taking us seriously as business professionals on the other side of the table, because the biggest I mean, my biggest fear is that they can try and make it personal Now you're just being very, you know, like you said, you don't want to be the odd one out or the one who's being very difficult. No one's been difficult. We're just negotiating here. So I think sharing the stories and actually enabling and empowering our members Mm. to have that shared sense of community. I mean, we invited most of our male members and female members to a meeting and to hear the different responses they got when they asked for these things was just horrifying. So to even find a common language to teach A&Rs and product managers and label executives that you're dealing with a professional, an ungendered professional here. And I know it may sound like like a weird thing to bring up, but it's a dynamic that we see more and more um, that's really plaguing the, the room for negotiation, especially And seeing as a lot of producers are men, it sort of skews the balance in their favor because they're being taken more seriously and yeah. asking for well, the exact same thing. So I also need, I think we need to discuss on a broader level, yeah. how, 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 how do we say these things and how do we, you know, how do we listen to whomever is saying it as well? I know it's, it may sound banal, But it's just, it's a dynamic that we've started seeing more and more here that seeing as most, many top liners are female and very few female producers 
even, you know, someone might shoot me for this, but there are so few female producers, which mm. is an issue as well. But producers yeah. are the ones who make the most money. So if we want to save a profession and also have a look at gender balance, there needs to be money for female writers because they're being doubly, it's, it's a double whammy, basically. You don't really produce, yeah. plus you're being constructed as just being obnoxious when you ask for points. Difficult. Yeah, yeah difficult. There's many sides of, like, this issue has many sides. Our time starts, uh, <laughs> starts to be up. Uh, so I want to thank you for the, these uh, very, very interesting um, comment, commentaries and uh, s- speeches or discussions that we had. And um, is there something you want to say, like, uh, like in the end, uh, a very hopeful <laughs> message <laughs> to send out there? Well, I think that we're, it's, it's amazing that all of this is happening, or, or, you know, both uh, all around Europe and in the U.S., at the moment and i think songwriters are, are speaking out so you know follow follow all of us on on uh, instagram and on social media because that's encouraging as well where where people are are sharing their stories and um i i think that the important part is is to support each other and to compare stories and 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 to give each other you know encouragement and and tips on how to approach it because in the end if they can't go anywhere else, if, if every songwriter um, uh, will, you know, ask for it for um, some sort of compensation, then it'll be more accepted. I, I would, you know, I'm, I'm really, uh, really encouraged that um, you're doing this in, in Finland and um, anything that we can do to help um, with, with any of, of uh, your campaigning, um, be more than happy to be there thank you and I, I think this is a first and foremost this is a community thing because we are a community of creators and i mean i want to thank you helene and the ivers and the fix streaming and pay songwriters campaigns for actually taking you know the big <laughs> fight taking it to parliament but i also want to say that because this is a community thing that this isn't a national thing we're all subject to the same crappy deals that that have been made, especially in streaming. So if, you know, if any of your members feel the need to reach out to us, we're always open. You can always email me or call me or whatever, because the more we share the experience, the more people who know that, oh, he or she just got points on the master. I'm going to ask for it as well. That's the community part of it. We have to talk to each other, as you said, Helian. We have to share the stories because that's the only way we got it off the ground in Denmark was that with the 20 biggest writers and the 20 biggest producers who went, wait a minute, I got this from that label and this a you should talk to him or her because, as you said, it's also a, a competitive edge. Mm-hmm. If they're willing to pay for the right song, they're going to get the right writers. So talk to him or her, and they're going to set you up. Share the stories and support each other in this. And we're always open if anyone needs advice or just to vent, which is also important. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, we're even looking to, to do songwriter camps where anything that comes out of those camps will incur a fee and points, and it'll be really big writers and, and middle-class writers on it. So again, just to kind of re reaffirm that. And I, I think that, that all of these things kind of contribute to, to changing the narrative. Thank you so much. And let's, uh, I hope we can continue this discussion in, in the future and uh, hope that things go in the good direction. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for being here. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Hmm. Bye.